I sat down for a conversation last week with my comrades, Mimi and Lynn. This summer, they made plans to visit Lynn's family in the Philippines. Although she anticipated a routine family visit, traveling there with Mimi for the first time provided a unique experience, as well as a new chance to reflect and learn from the people. So, um, I have a lot of family who still, uh, or who lives in the Philippines in Cebu, and uh, so this trip was my third trip back as an adult and, and my fourth trip overall, but um, Mimi's first trip there. So super excited to have my family meet him and him meet them, and um, yeah, it's just been many, many years in the making, um, and it, it, it finally happened this year. So. When talking about the Philippines, it's almost impossible to ignore its long history with colonialism. Since Magellan landed in 1521 all the way up to the late 1940s, Philippine society had been dominated by an outside power, first the Spanish, then the United States. That leaves an impact on a society, and it's easy to see some of that today. But beyond the more obvious examples, I wanted to know more about the subtle effects this legacy has. Many people, especially in the United States, think of colonialism as a past issue. How does this 500-year history continue to impact life today? I don't think, um, I think one of the things that was like striking for me was, um, you know, you can read about the history uh, in, in, in a, you know, a book and, um, but uh, seeing it in person and seeing how oppressive it is um, was re uh, really kicked my ass. And sort of this feeling, you mentioned sort of like names, um, the, uh, the Catholic churches, like sort of, uh, the, it's hard to sort of take a turn without seeing some sort of evidence of it. And it goes like beyond, um, you know, the Span Spanish, you know, uh, colonization, but then to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and it's you know U.S. business is um, it, it, it it's everywhere you know uh, um, and um, I think you know she was saying it's sort of sensitive because we, we you know have been talking about this earlier when it's like it's so thick you know and and you'll you'll hear a lot of things repeated where the people will sort of say things like we need discipline right that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, at, at sort of initially you're like, damn, why would you say that? You know, like, right. and this sort of idea that our, 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 our situation, um, is of our own making, right? Like, like we're at fault here. Um, but then taking a step back and realizing like, damn, like this country has been colonized, uh, for, you know, since 1565 or whatever it is. I don't know how um, it would be anything but that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like when you think Spain to the U.S., um, like uh, how long has it been since there's been an, uh, like a Filipino identity yeah. that hasn't had some sort of relationship with uh, a, a colonizer? You know. Um, so I think like. Even Oh yeah, that's right. And, and as a matter it of fact, it was the first, I think. I think the Visayas, the Visaya region, the Visayas region is where the Spaniards first sort of landed. And yeah, Cebu is. It's also a, a the the point where um, Lapu Lapu. So Are you familiar with that? Killed yeah. Magellan. Yeah. Killed Magellan. Yeah. So that's also in Cebu. It's on Mactan Island, which is just it's an island off of the larger Cebu Island. But I'd like to go back to that um, idea of like how colonialism sort of makes itself apparent in the Philippines as a Filipino American. And I think, I mean, the first thing that I wanna say is, is that this was my third trip back as an adult with my husband. And the first two were really kind of like, the first one for sure um, was my first trip back as an adult. So it was, you know, it was an experience where I was largely kind of being, really introduced to some of my family for the first time. Many of my cousins are much, much younger than me. Um, and then the second time was sort of like, you know, experiencing it as um, as a tourist in many ways, because we went to a really touristic area. Right. 
and that on that trip and then this third trip was really kind of eye-opening for me personally because now I'm I'm visiting what I have now you know what what now feels like a second home to me <clears throat> with my husband who sees the world in the way I see it so um you know things that weren't really apparent to me on those first two trips were very apparent to me um on this one so you know I think that the marks of colonialism show themselves in multiple ways as it does everywhere. But, you know, not only in the architecture, not only in, you know, like the names of the actual, you know, people and most people having Spanish names, um, the influence of Catholicism there, not only in, you know, the actual fixtures of Catholic churches everywhere, but also in the culture. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the prevalence of um, the relationship, I shouldn't say relationship, but really, you know, well, I'll just call it that for now, with the U.S. is, I think that is, is growing. That is, to me, the most predominant, um, the predominant um, uh, evidence of, colonialism in the U.S. because of the rise of all of these of U.S. businesses that have located in Cebu um, and then also kind of this uh, cultural things like malls you know Cebu is now home to one of the largest malls in Asia it just recently opened but there's a very very heavy mall culture there which is really interesting because you're on an island which is you know, par it's just, it's paradise. Yeah. Um, and then also, yeah, as, as Mimi mentioned, um, you know, one thing that I found really uh, unsettling um, and doesn't seem to show, you know, any, any, uh, it doesn't seem to be scaling back at all, at least in the last six years that I've, I've, I've been, but is, is the predominance of skin whitening. Um, products for women um, you literally cannot buy a moisturizer that does not have skin whitening um, so yeah I mean it's it's so it's like white supremacy oh yeah, yeah absolutely Heavy. absolutely and I think that comes not only from you know the Eurocentric ideal of beauty but um, I think it's also prevalent and, you know, I might get killed for this, but I was told uh, it, it's also his historically prevalent in, in Chinese culture as well. And so, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, most people, well, I don't know if most people, but a lot of Filipinos have some Chinese heritage. And then, of course, um, there are Chinese Filipinos who, who still live in uh, the Philippines. So, yeah, that's, sorry, that was long-winded, but... I mean, they're just, it's thick and it's heavy and it's, um, you know, as a Filipino American who on some level has experienced that, um, you know, kind of absorbing colonial mentality, uh, uh, once, you know, me as a Filipino American, once I'm in the Philippines and I'm sort of surrounded kind of by the origins of where that stems, um, you know, it's pretty... It's it's pretty. Um, it's heavy. Heavy. It's you know, heavy. I, again, I sort of said, I don't think it really. I mean, it resonates. You you read about this, right? Right. Um, and and you understand it. Um, but seeing it, um, I had moments for sure of uh, feeling um, despair. You know, uh, be, because. In, in there are moments where you feel like I I don't know that I feel like I see a way out of this. You know, um, you know, and, and, and of course, there are movements within the Philippines that are fighting. Um, but damn, that shit's that you know the 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 that colonial presence and um, it's it's heavy and it's 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 powerful. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the default, I guess, and you know, understandably so. Um, but once you get into you know deeper conversations with folks. You know, I thought that we also recognized that um, 
Filipinos do recognize it, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not their default. And so I think the fact that there's recognition and also that there are movements, um, you know, are, are signs of hope. The people of the Philippines have fought hard to rid themselves of colonial occupation and imperialist domination. When Spanish dominion ended as a result of the Spanish-American War, it was assumed the nation was finally free until U.S. forces arrived to forcibly suppress the new republic in yet another war. Independence finally came in 1946, yet for many the yoke of colonialism took a new form, capitalism. For 50 years, the New People's Army and the Communist Party of the Philippines have waged revolutionary war against the government, operating out of the jungles and the mountains. Besides official party publications, there's little information available about the ongoing conflict. You mentioned the New People's Army, the Communist Party of the Philippines, so there is active resistance going on. Did you get an idea of the general perception of uh, public opinion? I think, um, particularly when talking with uh, younger folks, mm -hmm. there's a greater degree of um, uh, sympathy and uh, maybe even support. Um, now, of course, th their perception uh, from within is different than what mine would be coming from the US. Mm -hmm. And I found uh, that folks had more practical responses with regards to the New People Army. Um, so even among folks that like were uh, supportive, um, you know, would mention, well, you know, they're very poor. Mm -hmm. And so that a lot of um, maybe interaction that, that they had mentioned, a lot of begging, right? right. And that, um, that some folks had said like, well, they may beg for food or money and that they get upset if uh, they don't get. And uh, mm -hmm. That I, one person had said that it was sort of unfortunate that um, it, it can become more about that than sort of a revolutionary message, you know, right. uh, that uh, more about th 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 they're, they're in need of resources, right. you know. Um, another, uh, uh, someone else said that they felt uh, that m they may need um, sort of a better like command control, like that um, they may tend to be sort of disconnected from one another throughout the country, you know? Yeah, yeah and that th there could be maybe better ways to, you know, that this is what I heard, that like right. better ways to sort of coordinate so that they were all sort of working together, you know? Um, but, you know, I think also to me, uh, the, the fact that they exist yeah. um, in 2019 um, and that, that they're um, sort of, um, uh, they have enough of an impact that they have to be a concern um, for the government is, to me, is uh, really inspiring, you know? And I mean, as, as um, a, a, you know, a country that's had U.S. support, the Philippines, yeah. um, the fact that you have, uh, like, a, a movement like this within a country, um, they're armed, you know? Um, that, that that's that's inspiring to me like wow you know just the, the existence is uh that's a trip you know right. um they i think they tend to um because i think they are on the run a bit that they tend to exist within mountains and sort of more um like where there's more of a peasantry right you know part of their strategy <laughs> yeah, and they're gorilla yeah. you know um so it's interesting because like we did ask folks like would you see them like uh, Cebu is a big city, right? Mm -hmm. Would you see them just walking around Cebu? And they're like, well, not unless they wanted to get, you know, like uh, arrested, right. you know. So, um, uh, but uh, so as from what I found, as you talk to folks and as they get older in age, mm -hmm. um, sort of hostility grows. Right. Uh, you know that there are they are disruptive. Uh, yeah, as you might expect, you right. know, like it, it may be like that here, you know, <laughs> like, uh, um, I mean, I know this is a stereotype and it's, it's not, it's probably not fair, but something, you, you know, you'll see a lot online, particularly on social media in, uh, in the U.S., a lot of poking at baby boomers, right? right. And of course, <laughs> all that shit, right? Like, and, you know, I know, like I said, I know that's not entirely fair, uh, but um, you know, well, 
there's some truth to it. And I think it would be the same way sort of in the Philippines with regards to the, the New People's Army. Although when you do look, which is interesting, when you look at like New People's Army leadership, um, they're, 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 they're not young. Like uh, th that it does run sort of the, the gamut in terms of age, you know, that you have very young folks, um, uh, you know, uh, up to, uh, you know, what, what seems to be like, you know, Bernie Sanders age, like right. shit that would be like unthinkable here in the U.S., like... Uh, I, 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 you know, I, th I find it to be inspiring. Hmm. Um, but I do think their resources are uh, really deprived of resources. Right. That's, so they have to, they have to balance trying to gain support, but also trying Eating. to gain the resources to survive. Yeah. yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. I also heard folks say that, and this is unfortunate, although it's not surprising, um, someone had told me that, like, Duterte mm -hmm. um, has... Um, co-opted or, or sort of um, like sort of uh, uh, what he's done is offered jobs like in the military mm -hmm. and that they, they may lose folks sometimes like right. if, if they can get a job they may end up doing something that's counter to sort of what it is that they're fighting for and it's um, but again you know I mean you know here like in the US that the military will you know heavily target oppressed communities right, yeah. to recruit like yeah. Seriously, you know, it's like, I, I get it, you know. Yeah. And I think a lot of, what, when Lynn was talking about, like, sensitivity, yeah. is that really trying to make sure that, like, as radicals visiting the Philippines, yeah. is that really looking at the experience with understanding as opposed to maybe sort of, um, like, a knee-jerk judgment, like, uh -huh. you're wrong for this, uh -huh. you're wrong for this, how, how could you do this? Right. Well, you know, when in fact it's, uh, I think... Having empathy and, and, and wanting to learn and understand, yeah, yeah. It's like, this is not as simple as, like, just do it. Like, mm -hmm. decolonization and, like, damn, this is going to be a process. Right. Like, it's had 500 years it's to... It's easy to look on the outside. And... Yeah, you know. I mean, I guess we, in to a different degree and in different sort of flavors, there are similar issues here in the United States. You know, right. like, we we have some problems that are sort of similar, like if we look at sort of like toxic masculinity, right? Like unpacking that and, and, and seeing men break from this behavior, um, I would love to be able to say, can we snap our fingers and have that go right away? But I mean, I, I know that's probably gonna take a minute. Like this behavior, the patriarchy and all that stuff, like it's had a long time to get its claws in there, you and know? The institutions, they hold it up, right? Yeah. Like Shit, seriously, like prime example, you know. So I think it, it, it's who can say, but I think it's going to take some time to unwrap to unravel this stuff, you know. But I do think for sure, like well, I guess why we're all here, like this that's a fight worth fighting for, you know. Right, like right. that's part of the effort. Yeah. So on the one side we have armed groups like the NPA, and on the flip side, on the other side we have the Philippine government under President Duterte probably most known for his harsh stances on certain political issues. He was quite popular when elected, of course. So how do people tend to feel about them, about him now, if, if they discuss that at all? Hmm. They support him. They like him. But there were a couple of things that were said that were, that were repeated. Um, Mimi mentioned earlier that you know, I, I think this is one of Duterte's lines about being disciplined. Huh. And um, most people we talked to about Duterte repeated that line and, you know, had actually embraced it, uh, embraced this idea that, you know, you know good things are going to happen um, under Duterte because he's going to help us become more disciplined. So there was that. That was repeated. Um, but I would say the, the, the first thing that most people mentioned was that, uh, you know, Duterte was helping to um, remedy the drug problem. Um, and I know, you know, we have feelings about that um, based on the stories that we get. Uh, but um, people were very happy about the results 
under Duterte um, in dealing with the drug problem there. I, I which would is also very complex. It's complex. But I would say that it, the one thing that was interesting was that support was so universally sort of uh, um, <laughs> positive mm -hmm. that then you sort of started to wonder like, where is information coming from? Oh, right. What sort of access is being, and, and sort of uh, allowance is given for critical, you know, pieces. And I do think they have some sensitivity um, and, and maybe even more than sensitivity, perhaps some anger about Western press portrayals of Duterte and uh, criticism. Yeah, they may say, and I think have said, like, it's not accurate um, or... Okay, one thing I heard a lot was that, like, the West picks up on how he talks. He's very crass, crude, right. um, and they will admit, like, he's sexist, right? He says very sexist things. Yeah. But um, that uh, you'd have to see it in context, right? Now, of course, like, you know, I, I, I love the guy, right? Like, uh, th he's part of the problem, you know what I mean? Um, but I maybe understand, I, I, I mean, in the way sort of like a, 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 a like a, some forms of populism might like when a people have been like, um, in, in sort of in need for some form feeling of like, not validation, but like, uh, support or I don't know what the word he's is, but to, he's able to portray himself as like a strong national. Yeah. National and that unifier. he's totally, and that he's really helping to strengthen the identity and to help them sort of stand up to, uh, problems that, uh, that they may have faced, you know? Um, now of course, you know, he's, he's doing so from, like I said, it's many it's forms of populism, like from very far right. And, uh, um, I, you know, while I'm not under any illusion that Western press is, you know, typically they're going to vilify, uh, uh, you know, leadership, um, you know, often in, in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there are some embellishments to, the, to this stuff. However, um, I, I, there's far too much press coming from within mm -hmm. and coming from Filipino voices um, I, you know, we see a lot right now with uh, uh, how deadly it is to be an environmental activist in the Philippines. As a matter of fact, it's, it's the deadliest country in the world. Like, and a lot of what's coming out about that, it's, it's coming from Filipino voices from within, you know. There's far too much, I think, that, like, um, I, it felt to me that, like, information, news was very sort of uh, within the country. It, it's there's an incredible bias. Mm -hmm. And again, w w you know, we could say the same here, right. you know, like, so. like we got major problems, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do think that that is something there that their access to critical pieces um, might be like here. Like we don't have it, you know? Would that I, I mean, I don't know that it's so much an absence of access, but rather um, a level of insularity, I, if that's a word, in culture, in terms of what are the news sources that you trust or what are your go-to news sources. Um, you know, I would probably think it's a fair statement to say that, you know, a lot of people who live in the U.S. who consider themselves Americans, that their first go-to sources of news are based in the U.S., you know, I know a lot of us in in our circles, you know, we seek news from other countries. Um, but I would say... But the general is turning to you where are you? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not dissimilar in the Philippines where, um, you know, that's, that's going to be their go-to source. Right. And it's coming from a Filipino perspective. Um, and while they may have access to our news sources or the same ones that we might seek for an opinion that... Um, maybe a more uh, objective and actually truly journalistic um, piece. Um, 
that that's not their go-to. It's not their default. So, does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean yeah. for sure. I think that you know that that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I do also feel I personally felt that um, that there was a little bit of um, maybe you know defensiveness about for sure um, someone from the U.S. coming in right. and uh, criticizing their leadership. You know, and I think there is a bit sort of of like of sort of a, you know, fuck you, look who your right. president is, you know, sort of, you know, they don't know our background or like yeah. where we're coming from that, you know, not only we fuck Trump, we're also fuck Clinton and fuck Biden and mm. on and on and on, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, you know, uh, in an initial meeting, right. I would imagine, yeah, there, that there was sort of like, uh, who are you to come into my country? Yeah, definitely that. Sure. Yeah, I do think that, you know, like y you're think, from the U.S., like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I get and that. I, I think, too, that, I mean, just in thinking about it, you know, Duterte, you know, he 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 speaks his mind. He does not, uh, he, he doesn't filter himself. Um, it's just his mind is it's bad. Right. right. I mean, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but... I think that actually, um, given the history of the Philippines, uh, a, a, a leader who, who demonstrates no fear and no filter, um, you know, is, and I'm not trying to defend him. I'm just trying to understand, you know, part partly why there may be support. Um, is that you know that that perhaps that's a sign of strength, and you know. And I do think for sure, like they are very. Uh, there's th nobody uh, was supportive of of uh, in words of Aquino and you know pre Duterte. Um, as a matter of fact, like. One thing that you hear repeatedly is like we're so sick of corruption, mm -hmm. you know, and that seeing prior administrations right. as being so corrupt, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that they, I felt like they, they, there's a real want to believe that Duterte um, would sort of take hard stands against corruption. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's uh, right. They did feel so that. Sort of that's similar right. to the idea. Very outside. similar. Yes. At, almost identical. Yes. It's the yes. same. That same sort of thing, like, you know, you heard this throughout the campaign, you know, like folks supporting Trump, like, well, he speaks his mind, he's got right. no filter, and it's like, it's almost identical, yeah, yeah. you know? Like, th that, those things were said, you know, you heard that over and That's over right. and over again. During, right. Like, it's very similar, Good you point. know? Yeah. Um, what's different is I, I actually... Uh, this is hard to tell in one visit, but because it was so universal in support of him, mm -hmm. it was a little bit difficult. And now thinking back about it, like, how comfortable did you feel speaking openly about criticism of right. Duterte? I don't know. You know, we've seen, you know, reports that we see over here, but, like, some of them don't look good. And some of them, like, right. shit, you know. I mean, you've seen photographic evidence of like some of the brutality you know like I can't tell I really don't know how comfortable you might be speaking open in a public place oh fuck that guy he's a you know like I don't know I really don't know and as a matter of fact I did get the sense when you started a conversation with folks about the new people's army mm -hmm. um that there was some a little bit of like uh Hesitant? Oh, th there was definitely hesitance. Like, a little, you know, and, and a smile. Like, oh, wow. You know, so... But like, I think also that that had to do with the fact that a lot of people that we were talking to were working at the hotels we were staying at. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I really do think that if we could have talked to them privately off, off location, right. that... I felt the same way, though, with folks on the street that I talked to. You know? Really? Yeah. Uh, it was it was rare to talk to somebody and they'd just be like, oh, yeah, let's talk about that. 
you know, there was always sort of a, 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 a smile and like, um, yeah. And again, maybe, I could see from I mean, their perspective maybe you're that right. I, I didn't, I wondered about that. Yeah. I, I, it's a good question. I, I don't know, you know, but, um, again, like talking to people on the street, they don't know who we are and like right. what angle we're coming at with this. Yeah, like, just how comfortable are you both to be talking about an armed insurrection? Yeah. Right. And like, shit, what if they're cops? Yeah. You know, like, and I have to, yeah, go new people's army. I'm supporting them financially. <laughs> like they wouldn't know that like, it's a tough one. Like how do you, how do you have those conversations uh, when they're labeled, you know, a, a terrorist organization internally and by the European Union and by the U.S., right. you know. Well, I was just going to say that. I mean, I think the hesitance might be that, that they're very aware that um, they're, they're being categorized as terrorists. Yeah. So. One thing I would say, though, for sure, is that I felt that um, I got a much greater feeling that if there was going to be perhaps... Uh, a political influence that was could be um, I don't want to say uh, like like transformative that might wouldn't be the right word but that would have impact it would be from maybe uh, the Muslim area of Mindanao mm. um, uh, you know it's, it covers a great uh, you know it covers a great chunk of land right. um, but also uh, because the country is uh, you know it has been colonized by Spain um, you know, you have sort of this autonomous area that's Muslim mm -hmm. that sits inside this really, this heavily Christian country, right. you know? Uh, and often hearing from folks, I don't want to say it's hostility to the, mu the, 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 the Muslim area, but maybe... Or I think that's a fair characterization. Hostility. Yeah, like... Or like religious tension or just general... Both. Or Both. Both. Um, and, and, you know, you hear words like dangerous, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, not safe. Uh, and got the feeling like uh, from north of there that like, well, I, I didn't get the feeling that folks liked them very much, but there was sort of this like recognition that that area may have, um, th there may be a reason to feel like that's an area to be reckoned with, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to something you said earlier, it's the deadliest country for environmental activism. What what do you think is causing that, I guess? Is it a lack of regulation? Is it... Why is it so dangerous? Right. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. I will say this. Um, what, what is being... What you see a lot of development... Um, a lot of development is focused around the establishment of, like, resorts. Mm. Um, the one area that we were in, an island called Bahol, had just built, and it was operational. Um, was that an international airport? Yeah. An yep. international airport. And this is on a, a small island, right? right. Um, that, uh, you know, where there's rice terraces and, like, but there's this new international airport there. And so what you do see is a lot of... Um, uh, uh, condominiums, resorts, that sort of thing. And, you know, this is all being built in an in, in, in archipelago, like in, in the jungle, mm -hmm. you know? So I think if, if you're going to clear way for... Oh, I think we also saw some... Um, what do you call that? Uh, uh, open face mining, where uh, you mm -hmm. remove the, the side mm -hmm. of a, a mountain. Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, we saw like that mountain. on Cebu. As yeah. we were taking the ferry from... Behold, back to Cebu. I had seen it. What is that called again? You see it all over Pennsylvania. Strip mining. Uh, but uh, but it's it's actually um, you're clearing um, you're you're like clearing the face of the mountain of a mountain for yeah. development or yeah. for mining. They're basically like they were defaced. They were mountains that were defaced. Yeah. So yeah. if 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 a lot of the revenue is coming from like foreign investment in the forms of casinos and um, property and uh, not casinos, uh, uh, resorts. Yeah, I was gonna uh, yeah say casinos, it. right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, but you know, you have to. Th it, this is all sitting on, on like nature, on 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 um, 
uh, foliage on, you know, you have to get rid of all that shit and disrupt uh, ecosystems, right? So this is tricky. Like, obviously, they need revenue, right? Right. But the cost that that's, you know, it, it's the, the habitat's being destroyed. So I would think that there, if you were going to be um, an environmental activist who may um, block, I, 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 I don't know, that would, I could understand why it would be dangerous. So it seems then like a lot of the regulation then is also very weak or non-existent even? From an environmental perspective, yeah. uh, from what I saw, like the fact that this was happening, mm-hmm. um, and again, not that this stuff doesn't happen here and that we're oh, not, yeah. you, I, you know, but I, I wouldn't have said it was much better than here. Mm-hmm. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I, I think, but, you know, there are some things that are acceptable that are being um, led by Duterte's government, you know, like he's cleaned up Boracay, but these cleanups, they're not just because, you know, it's unsanitary and unsafe for people visiting these areas, but it's because, you know, you want to keep those areas pristine so that you start, you know, you keep attracting the money and the dollars. So there are these cleanup projects in the more touristic areas. Um, Palawan, El Nido Palawan is being cleaned up right now, but it's also... Uh, when Boracay was shut down for six months, nine months, I can't remember how long it was, but um, the rise in tourism or or of tourists going to El Nido um, skyrocketed, and there's like a ton of development going on in El Nido right now, and at the same time that the area is being cleaned up. And I think there are some other touristic areas that are being targeted for cleanup, of course, because you want, you want, it, it, it's not because you, <laughs> it's not for the broader reasons that it should right. be about, but it's because, you know, you want to make sure, or that government wants to make sure that those tourist dollars still, still roll in. Um, and there are some, you know, a lot of kind of like the, the commodification of green um, mm-hmm. uh, going on there where, you know, there's a, you know, no single-use plastic kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they won't give you a straw, but they serve you, serve you your drink in a plastic cup. Um, yeah. You know, and, of course, you know, bamboo grows there. So a lot of bamboo straws, which is cool. I mean, that's awesome. Um, but, again, you know, it's sitting next yeah. to... It's all, there are all these contradictions, right? Um, it just follows as that, it is here, but... The individual responsibility yeah. shit. Like, right. yeah. you know, like... Uh, Again, very similar to here right. in that regard. Right. Like, you're and, gonna make the difference. Yeah. Right. And like, you're saying, like, who, who is this development for? Is it for the people? Oh, right. no. Right. No. Exactly. No. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I mean, it sucks to say this, but one place that she and I stayed at, yeah. um, uh, uh, in, in an island called Bahol, it's beautiful. Uh, but one place we stayed at, uh, a, a waiter. Um, at the the sort of the hotel restaurant, um, we made friends with him and like would hang and talk with him every day and that sort of thing. And uh, he had told us that the next day or a couple of days was his wife's birthday, and we were like, "Oh wow, you know that's really exciting." And uh, um, do you have anything special planned? And he said like, uh, uh, "You know, we're just gonna relax." And then I think we said. Um, so you're going to get her a piece of birthday cake. And he was like, why? I can't afford that, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's fucked up. Like, um, you know, you have folks who are serving uh, uh, tourists from other countries, serving them pieces of cake that they can't afford themselves right. to buy a piece of cake for the wife's birthday. Yeah. So the idea that... Cake is just cake. Basically. Yeah, and... The idea that this development here, this tourist development, is is going uh, back to the people, like, no fucking way, right. you know? I mean, the, the poverty is real, you know? Um, and it's, when you see the money spent from outside the country, um, holy shit, like, uh, the U.S. dollar goes a long way. Um, that 
more of that isn't getting to the people is just, it's, it's unconscionable. It's, it's really gross. And sad. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say, like, did we had a, a morning where we just sort of were talking about this, this guy who couldn't afford a piece of birthday cake. You know, we started crying. You know, and it's just you make friends with folks and like you hear them and what their stories are and like really wonderful and warm people and yeah. uh, um, and then that comes up and you're just like, fuck, you know, this 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 is brutal. It's something you hear you don't even think about. No. Yeah. N- no, that's hard. Yeah. You know, um, it did it did. I'm sure, it doesn't feel good. You know, um, and then of course you know you also have this feeling of like. I really felt, after visiting there, like, um, how do you move in terms of international solidarity and support beyond sort of performative expressions of solidarity to really substantive, uh, 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 um, you know, sort of expressions or actions, you know, and really started to think about that, like, well, you keep hearing over and over again that the new People's Army is so resource deprived. And the people there, like... If you can't afford a cake, what else can you not afford? Holy shit, seriously, you know? And really started to think about that as, like, an organizer, as an activist, as a radical, like, uh, really made you think about, like, how can you take steps beyond sort of, like, again, sort of performative and, and to really tangible, like, no, you want to make a, a, a difference that's appreciable, like, that you can quantify, right. you know? Um, and, and to me, it was, it was one of the, aside from really marveling at the warmth and generosity and kindness of the people, mm-hmm. um, and the sense of community there, um, uh, but one of the other big takeaways, I, I, I definitely left feeling like, shit, I mean, I'm fucking, you know, 44 years old, like, I don't have a ton of time left, like, mm-hmm. I'd love to be able to, contr- you know, really contribute in a substantive way. I was grateful to be able to have this conversation with my comrades. I got a real sense of their experience, and I think we can all learn a lot from the history of the nation. Lynn's experience as a Philippine American, and Mimi's experience as someone with no previous exposure to the culture, provided an interesting lens to tell a truly unique story. Thank you for listening, and thank you again to my guests Mimi and Lynn. Mimi also wrote an article about their trip, The link for that can be found in the description. For more Red Talks and other camera and sickle content, be sure to like and subscribe, and help our community grow by sharing with a friend.